cross-shaped lives. Um, I was very keen to preach this sermon. I said to Joel, it's important that I do this one. And so I'm talking today about persecution, uh, which might strike you as being a slightly strange subject. Um, a, a subject like this is actually a big challenge to preach. And um, I feel God has taken me on a journey thinking, thinking about this one in the last couple of years, actually. And so um, what I want to bring to you today, um, I feel like is potentially one of my most controversial sermons I've ever, I've ever preached. So um, I kind of feel like if there's, no, if there's no sense of being slightly offended in this, I'm not sure I'm doing my job right. I know that sounds a bit, oh, you're going to offend us now. I'm not going out deliberately to offend you all, but, but I feel, you know, if the Bible isn't provocative, even to Christians, if we're not sometimes deeply challenged to our core, as God just wants to readjust us, then maybe there's something wrong. If it's all sweetness and light and a lovely, wonderful, I'm a Christian gospel and we're all clapping our way to heaven, there's something wrong. And so I want to kind of just um, bring something to you today. So let's see how it goes. Um, whether I preach this anywhere else or not depends on how well it goes today. <laughs> depends on how, how, how offensive I am. No. <clears throat> okay. Let me start with a, of a passage. Um, there's no one text. There's a number of scriptures. So I'm going to start. They should all come up on the screen. John 19, 16 to 18. This is the New Living Translation. Most will be NIV. It says, um, then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called Place of the Skull, in Hebrew Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Do you know what this is? This is a terrible graphic picture of a death march. That's what's happening. You see, in the Roman Empire, everyone knew what the sight of a man carrying his cross meant. It meant he's walking to his death. There was no other destination for a man carrying his cross. True, Joseph Arimathea carries the cross of Jesus for a while, but it wasn't Joseph Arimathea's cross, it was Jesus' cross. And when you carry your cross, in the Roman world, it means you're going to die. Um, and so the, follow, the followers of Jesus knew very well the implication of these words that Jesus gave and spoke to them. This is what Jesus had already said. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try and hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And do you know what? For many Christians of Jesus' day, that literally meant giving up their lives. They understood this passage in a very um, challenging way. Do you know, at the height of Roman, uh, the emperor Diocletian's reign, there's, there's something called the Great Persecution. And it was started in 303 AD. And 3,500 Christians were put to death for not following traditional Roman religious practices. It's a lot of people who are saying, I'm not going to worship that God. I'm going to worship the one true God, even if you kill me. And that's what they did in the Roman world. And so when we read the Bible, we read things about the cross and all that, it has a context within its culture. But in the 21st century, zooming ahead to us now, the phrase, take up your cross, means something quite different. You may not agree with what I'm about to say, but I just want to say it because I think it needs to be said. Sometimes we equate it to things like this. Do I have to say no to my child wanting to play football on a Sunday? God, take up my cross. 
Not another offering. <laughs> Do I have to give again? <laughs> Didn't we have an offering recently? Why do we have gather on the weekend I was hoping to go on holiday? That's the very weekend I wanted to go, and you've got to gather. Oh, no, I better take up my cross and go to gather. Well, there's that phrase, you know, we all have our cross to bear, you know. We all have our cross to bear. Like it's some minor inconvenience. I just want us to see the contrast. What would Christians from 303 AD make of us? Have we correctly contextualized, take up your cross for our uh, 21st century Western culture? Okay? Is it okay to put spin on the phrase so that we can hang on to our reputation, we can hang on to our standing, We can hang on to our jobs. We can hang on to our money. Don't, you know, don't go too far. Don't say too much. Don't rock the boat. So it's going to be controversial. It gets more controversial than this, but we'll we'll have a break from controversy in a second. Um, Or does Jesus still challenge us to be ready to literally walk to our death for being known as a Christ follower? Do you know, it depends what country you ask that question in, doesn't it? We're going to get to that in a minute. So today, I want us to consider what the New Testament teaching on persecution is. Only some of it. There's quite a lot of it, actually. The more I looked at it, the more I realized there was. It's a huge amount, uh, which we really shouldn't neglect. So I want to look at some of that. And then I want to look at persecution around the world, because persecution around the world is a very, very real thing. It's only really facts and figures. Um, we haven't got time to to look at it in in, in greater detail. But again, maybe we should be doing that as well. Maybe we should take time to do that sort of thing. I think it's a very good exercise for us to understand, and we probably have a big responsibility uh, to the persecuted church around the world. Um, But then I want to finish by asking a question. Where has persecution gone in 21st century Britain? That's where I'm ending. What an interesting question that is. (laughs) Okay, so anyway, let me just quickly pray, and then we'll dive in. Lord, this is, uh, for us, Lord, in 21st century Britain, this is a difficult subject for us, Lord. Um, Lord, I don't want us to feel guilty uh, or condemned in the wrong way. I don't want us to feel, uh, you know, even legalistic about this. But, Lord, I do want us to face up to it and face up to the reality of what what I believe you're teaching from Scripture. So, Lord, I pray, help me, give me uh, the right words to say, the right phrases to use. Lord, I pray for our hearts, that we'd have the right hearts Uh, to hear your word and to allow it to shape us and affect us uh, and change us, Lord. And then, Lord, if we need realigning, then, Lord, may we be realigned. And, Lord, also prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts for what maybe the future will hold in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what does the New Testament teach us? You see, when the disciples started preaching the gospel, they're making a bold declaration to the Roman world. They're saying there is a new king on the throne. It isn't Caesar, it's Jesus. That's what they're saying. And so Paul writes to the Philippians. This is what he writes, famous words, Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You preach that in Rome, first century Rome, you're a revolutionary. Those are powerful words. We see them as an amazing declaration. They are amazing. and We agree with them, but it's the context in which you share them will create maybe the reaction that you might get. This is a revolutionary message. There is a kingdom greater than Rome, the kingdom of God. We cannot really understand how big that was. We cannot, because we haven't lived in Rome under the Roman authority, under the Roman boot. Um, I've had to call it the jack boot, but I'm getting my things muddled up there. Under the Roman boot. We haven't lived in, under that to understand. But some people in the world kind of do live under those regimes. And they would understand it more than we understand it. 
We need help to understand these things. We need the Spirit to illuminate them for us. You see, the Christian's insistence on one God challenged the Roman pantheon of gods. And consequently, it totally impacted the Roman economy. So when Paul goes to Ephesus in Acts 19, there's a riot. Because Demetrius, the silversmith, is losing trade in selling silver statues of the goddess Artemis. It's really impacting Ephesus. So they're rioting because they're losing money. And of course, they're, oh, you know, what about our wonderful goddess that's worshipped all over the world? The gospel has really impacted society in that moment. Culture is challenged to the core in that moment. And it's interesting that it's through it's the economy that's wavering here. Paul knew that wherever he, it was preached, the gospel would evoke a violent response among some people. Paul expected that wherever he went, wherever he's preaching, he's expecting that. We don't expect that. We don't expect that at all. We may expect a, you know, a couple of people to swear at us or something. Get out of the way, you, you nutter. <laughs> you might expect that, maybe. <clears throat> but we do not expect the violent response that Paul expected. So, in Antioch... Um, 1350, uh, so, sorry, so, totally, let me start that verse sentence again, that's rubbish. So in Antioch, Acts 1350, not in Antioch 1350, that would be a completely different story at all of what was going on in the, in, in the Middle Ages. So in Antioch, in Acts 15, 1350, tells us this, get on with it, Rodney, tells us this, Jewish leaders stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Okay, so they're in Antioch, the Jewish leaders, they, they expel Paul and Barnabas. So, they move on to Iconium. But there, there's a plot to stone Paul. And so, they manage to escape that plot. Only for the persec- his persecutors to finally catch up with him in Lystra, where they did finally stone him so violently that they left him for dead. Paul looked dead. To all intents and purposes. That's a bloody scene. Horrendous scene. What does Paul look like when he gets up off the ground? There's blood pouring down his face, maybe. There's bruises. I mean, his eyes, you know, it could be terrible, couldn't it? The swelling, who knows? It's a violent moment. (laughs) But Paul gets up and carries on. Um, And then later, he goes back. It says, later, Paul and Barnabas turned, returned to these new church plants. So he's planting these churches in these towns. <clears throat> so they then return. It says in Acts 14, 21, 22. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. So Paul not only experienced persecution, he understood the need to teach it to the churches. Okay? But isn't it interesting that the Bible frames a warning of many hardships ahead as strengthening and encouraging? If I say to you, Redeemer, there are many hardships ahead. We're going to have mobs chasing us down the street. You may get stoned. You know, some of you may be thrown in prison. You may not take that as a, great, I feel strengthened and encouraged. We might take that the wrong way. We might take that a very different way. I think that says everything about the difference where we're at at this moment. I'm not, you know, I'm with you in this, by the way. You know, you could be saying the same thing to me. Um, Because we don't like that sort of thing, do we? And we're not used to it, and we try and avoid it. I don't know if we're ever really in that position where we end up, you know, facing it. But, okay. But it shows how important this teaching is to prepare new believers. Our teaching to prepare new believers doesn't have any of this in it. I reckon Paul's um, foundation course would have looked very different from our foundation course. You know? Paul's family membership course, we had family membership around our house on on Wednesday. It's lovely. I loved it. I loved meeting new people. It was fantastic. We didn't talk about this. 
I didn't strengthen them by saying, by the way, the minute you leave this door, there's probably going to be a mob of, you know, down the road. Anyway, many years later, reflecting on his life of ministry, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what the Bible says. We can't apologize for it. We mustn't move over it. It's there. And all scripture is valuable for teaching and training and instructing. So it's there for us. But let me ask that question. Is Paul just writing this because of his particular experience? Do you see Paul's writings? Well, he went through that, so he's bound to put that in the letter to Timothy. How do you view scripture? Or is God speaking to every generation about the cost of living a godly life? Where are you going to come down on interpreting that scripture? Are you going to interpret it just culturally? Or are you going to think that applies to me, to us? And it wasn't just Paul, all the apostles faced persecution. So Peter's letters are written to strengthen churches who are about to go through some terrible trial. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14, Peter writes this to the church. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Amen. That passage should challenge us. It's interesting, isn't it? The New Testament, it doesn't treat persecution as something strange. We would treat it as something strange to the degree that they suffer, Paul suffer, but the, the Bible doesn't te- treat it in that way at all. In fact, the Bible does something quite interesting with it. The Bible says it's a participation in the sufferings of Christ. So there seems to be a link, really, between persecution and it, that we face and, and Jesus' sufferings. Do you know what? I'll just try and put it in a nutshell as I understand it. I think there's more to it than this, but... As we suffer for Jesus, we are putting Christ on display in our lives. Visually preaching the the gospel to the world. That's what I think happens. Where the suffering church is putting Christ on display. And I believe it preaches the gospel to the world. Isn't that what happened in the Roman Empire? Isn't that what happened when they threw them to the lions? Isn't that what happened when they had them in the Colosseums? And these Christians, they wouldn't fight back. <clears throat> they wouldn't be, oh no, you know, they wouldn't be screaming and crying, as far as we know. You know, they're there receiving, okay, this is part of the price we have to pay. Wasn't it something like that that turned the Roman world upside down? Their response to suffering and persecution. Isn't it interesting? Insults are seen as a sign that the Spirit of Christ rests on you. That's very interesting. Do we ever explain to new believers that a sign of the Spirit on you will be suffering? A sign of the Spirit. Well, you may speak in tongues. Oh, sign of the Spirit. Yeah, I prophesy. Sign of the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, I feel filled with the Spirit. I'm going to worship God. Great, a sign of the Spirit. You're suffering. You're persecuted. Yeah, sign of the Spirit. Again, we don't put that in our foundation courses, do we? But that's what Peter's putting in there. He's saying this is a sign. A sign that God rests on you. This is how the Bible treats persecution. It views it in a way that we don't view it. It views it, we view it in a way where we are trying our hardest to avoid it. And I'm coming to this in a minute. We try to avoid it. But do you know what? The Bible says, no, that's not how you view it. You view it as participating in the sufferings of Christ. You view it as a sign that the Spirit of God is on you. The Bible sees persecution in a way that we see it very differently in the West. Um, This is what Jesus said. If they persecuted me, 
they will persecute you also. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, plain talking. <laughs> if they persecute me, they will persecute you also. So scripture teaches us that being in Christ will inevitably lead to suffering and persecution because that's what Jesus faced. But if you think about it, that kind of makes such good theological sense because we talk about being placed into Christ, don't we? We talk about my life is hidden with Christ in God. And we love all the nice side of that. When Christ died, I died. When Christ was buried, I was buried. When Christ was raised, I was raised. I'm teaching all this stuff to Edinburgh the other weekend. But there's another side to it. If I'm in Christ, he was persecuted and suffered, so I will be persecuted and suffer. Because I'm in Christ. So you can't be in Christ and have one thing and not the other thing. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. If you're in Christ, then there's something else that comes along with this. Okay, have I cheered you all up yet? <clears throat> okay, let's move on. Persecution today. <clears throat> so, sadly, persecution is still very common around the world today. You know, in 2023, approximately 365 million Christians were subject to high levels of persecution and discrimination, according to the Open Doors World Watch List. That's a shocking amount, isn't it? 365 million Christians. One in seven Christians were persecuted worldwide last year. It's quite high. I don't think we'll find one in seven in here. But in Africa, it's one in five. Do you know, 4,998 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons in 2023, do you know what, 90% of... Anybody know where 90% of those would have been? Shout out a country. Nigeria. Yes. It is Nigeria. 90% of Christian killings last year were in Nigeria. I know. Okay, five highest countries for persecution. You probably would guess these. North Korea, Somalia, Libya, Eritrea, and Yemen. They had the highest rates of reported persecution. That list up there gives you the top 50. Look for a Western country on there. You won't find one. There's two that aren't Western, but um, Western people go to a lot. One is Mexico. Another one is Turkey. They're both in there. Turkey's 50th, Mexico's a little bit higher. But Western countries aren't there, okay? So maybe, maybe we're okay in the civilized West. Well, hey, we get away with it. There's no persecution for us. We'll pray for our brothers and sisters, but we're okay. Let me ask my last question. Where has persecution gone in 21st century Britain? This is a very personal part of the preach from me. For more than one reason, actually. Some people believe that in the last 250 years... Uh, we've been living in an unusual bubble of Christian freedom in the West. Okay? So, in other words, the church is persecuted throughout the centuries, but there's been this, this, this strange bubble in the last 250 years where actually we've had some freedom in the West uh, that is kind of like <clears throat> little, almost out of kilter uh, with the rest of um, history. Where we've been able to preach the gospel under a banner of tolerance and free speech. Well, I believe something else has been happening. And, and this is the reason I believe it. Because no culture or government or silversmith wants to hear that their idols are no gods at all. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that all men and women everywhere need to repent and bow the knee to Jesus, who is the only true king. I don't think people want to hear that wherever it is. I think people are people. Sin is sin. Fallen mankind is fallen mankind, <clears throat> whether it is in North Korea or whether it's in the UK. And wherever this gospel confronts culture, <clears throat> I believe there's always a backlash. But while Satan's strategy remains violent opposition in many parts of the world, in the West, I believe his strategy has switched to making us rationalize and compromise truth. 
I think he's been subtly working in the West with a different game plan to what he does, let's say, in North Korea. How has this happened? And it's happened, I believe, over the last 250 years. It's not like just now. <clears throat> We're 250 years down the line of this, and each time it's getting strengthened and strengthened. But I believe it's come through a string of worldly philosophies and theories, such as evolution, and I believe through the deification of science, which has sucked Western Christianity into a slow retreat of biblical truth as we compromise with modern humanistic theories. Um, but we've done, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? We, we often criticize other, other cultures. They criticize. We, oh, that's the wrong word. I, I don't mean the word criticize. We often think, oh, isn't it a shame when other cultures, when they seem to tag Christianity onto their existing religion, so in other words, you get, okay, they, they, they sing Christian songs and that, and that, but they still have ancestor worship. That's what I mean. And we see that happening in places around the world. But do you know what? I think the same thing has happened in the West. I think we've done exactly the same thing. It's just that our gods are different. Our gods are theories, philosophies, intellect. But do you know what? We haven't noticed this retreat. I've been slowly getting back from that lectern deliberately. I don't know if you've noticed. I, I'm just not thinking how I'd do that. It hasn't really worked, I don't think, because I'm about to trip over some wires. <laughs> we haven't noticed this retreat because it's bit by bit. It's decade after decade. It's generation after generation. And over 250 years, we suddenly find ourselves... In 21st century Britain, here, when 250 years ago we were there, if the edge of the stage is standing for truth, the whole truth of the Bible, let's just call it that, the whole counsel of God, over the last 250 years, I believe we've been on slow retreat. And we are just one of many, many generations that has done that. And I believe we've been unaware that we've been doing it. I believe we've been unaware that we've been mixing the gospel with other gods Western gods. Our gods are theories. Our gods are philosophies. Our gods are our intellect. We may not have ancestor worship. Uh, we may not have, you know, other idols in the images of a kind of like a, a, a vaguely human-looking god. But we have gods. And I believe we've mixed them. We haven't noticed this retreat. Do you know what? I believe we've learned to live with an increasingly ungodly culture by compromise, rationalization, and somehow by squirming. We've learned to live in this culture, and we've learned to mean that, <clears throat> okay, I can be a Christian. Uh, if, I, if I don't do that, I do this. Okay, I can still be a Christian, but I'll just kind of like take my stand here. Okay, I can be all right. Okay, and I believe we've learned to, to kind of like somehow winkle our way. I, don't know, I need to find some better words for this. Uh, in our culture. And this is the thing, right? Western Christianity has allowed itself to become increasingly relegated to a personal faith and a personal morality. Okay? <clears throat> so in other words, the world will say, it's okay to be a Christian privately, but don't bring your religion to work. Don't bring your religion to the science table to talk about what you believe. How you know? Because we have science now; we can prove it. We have it. We now understand things. You know, religion. Well, it has a good place for personal morality, <clears throat> but we're a clever culture now. We're <clears throat> we're a clever society. We're evolving, <clears throat> not understanding at all what that word means and what the end game of evolving would mean. That's another talk. Um, if we took our stand for truth at work, I think we'd find an intolerant society that would persecute us. <clears throat> I'll have an example. Um, it's an example from our family. It's Sue. Okay, so when Sue 
Um, <clears throat> I think it was her first major job after she'd graduated at university in London. She got a job <clears throat> with the RNIB, and she was brailing. And they trained her up to braille, <clears throat> and she learned how to do that. She still knows how to do it today. She told me the other day, I said, what does that mean? She said, oh, I'll just read it in braille for you and tell you. <laughs> so she can still do all of that, because uh, they trained her well. Um, but then she had this magazine that she had to do. And she starts braiding the magazine and just working her way through it. And then she comes to a section on horoscopes. And she's become a Christian maybe uh, a year and a half ago, maybe two years, something like that. And she feels the conviction of God to say, you shouldn't be doing that. You should not braille horoscopes. So she's with a dilemma. What does she do in her work? So... She very bravely makes a stand, and she talks to her boss, and she says, "I'm a Christian, and I, I you know, I'm enjoying doing this work, and, and you know, but I, I can't do the horoscopes. They, they kind of like they basically clash with my faith. I don't believe that's right." And she gave them an answer. Look, why don't you? I, I, well, let's. Can I swap some work with somebody else? So maybe somebody else in the team can do the horoscopes, and I will do another part of the magazine. So I'm not trying to get out of work. Um, and the guy said, no, you've got to do it. Turns out later, he used to write horoscopes. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> he says, no, you can't. And she says, very bravely, but I'm very sorry, but I'm not going to do it because I'm a Christian. So she's bringing her faith into the workplace right at that point. And he says, well, okay, then, well, you're, you're not going to be out carrying with your job. And so the long and the short of it is she um, had to face a tribunal. And they give her a union rep. And she gets a union rep. And the union rep is a Buddhist. And he absolutely slates her for her faith. <laughs> so I found a lot of good that was. And so she goes up before the tribunal and she loses her job. So she got sacked in modern Britain for saying, no, I will not brow horoscopes. When you push culture, it will become intolerant and persecute you. I can guarantee you. That is what will happen in our culture. We've learned to work around it. So Sue's response could have been, well, Lord, don't let me read it. None of it affects it. You know, I'm just going to do it. Maybe everybody that reads these horoscopes, may they get nothing out of it. She could have had a Christian response like that. That's the way we squirm. That's called the squirming bit. I'll somehow justify what I do and I'll kind of pray over it. I don't see that in the Bible, that approach. She took a stand. Do you know what? Beautiful thing. that She, she, she just told me um, yesterday, I think. She said, you must tell them about the day I left, Okay. So the day she left, so she went back, she, she, she had to, you know what you do, you have to pack up all your stuff, put it in a box or whatever, and leave the office. She said, I was filled with such joy. I was praising God. I was singing choruses. I was delighted because I was considered worthy enough to suffer for Jesus. That's what it does to you. It turns it on its head. Something that we think, oh no, oh no. Suddenly, ah, oh, I'm filled with a new joy. I understand God in a new way. Jesus smiles at me in a new way because this is what it means to, to, to be part of the sufferings of Christ. Conclusion. Was the band like to come up? <laughs> um, so where do we go with this? This is where I felt to take you. Okay, so many Western Christians think that if a day comes where they cannot freely preach the gospel, then they will take a public stand for truth. You know, the day that comes when I can't preach, I'm going to stand for truth. A few people said that was the pandemic, but I'm not going to comment on that at all. <laughs> But people think that. People feel like there's this day when, okay, the day I can't preach the gospel in public, then I'm going to take a stand for truth. Brothers and sisters, 
That day came and went many years ago. You missed it. Other generations missed it. Try teaching intelligent design in a secondary school. Try explaining God created the male and female in a university. Try and pray within 150 metres of an abortion clinic. Culture has been pushing us back and pushing us back. And we've been rationalising it, agreeing with it. Okay, okay, okay. And we've been on slow retreat. Which is the generation that will finally hold a line in public and be willing to preach the whole counsel of God and pay the cost? Because it's paying a cost. I want to finish with this. The Bible talks about David's mighty men, okay? Now here's one of them. Let me just read a few verses of this mighty man. Elizar, it's from 1 Chronicles 11. Elizar, one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David at Pasdamin, where the Philistines gathered there for battle, at a place where there was a field full of barley. The troops fled from the Philistines. That's, the Israel, that's the David's troops. The troops fled from the Philistines. But they, that's Eleazar and David, but they took their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it and struck the Philistines down and the Lord brought her out a great victory. God is looking for mighty men and women in the West who will take a stand, they'll take their stand in the middle of the barley field when everybody else is retreating and fleeing. Which one of you, which one are you in that story? Will God call you Eleazar? Or are you one of the troops? As a church, which one are we in Redeemer? Are we David and Eleazar? Or are we the troops? Can we stand? I'll briefly pray and then we're going to sing. Lord Jesus, we love you. We really do love you. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We thank you so much for your incredible love, your incredible mercy, your incredible goodness towards us. You've been so generous to us, it is unbelievable. We are more loved than we dare believe. And nothing will take that love away. We have it for all eternity. When we're born again, we're born again for all eternity. And we thank you for that. But Lord, we struggle in our culture. We struggle to know where should we be standing as a Christian? Where should we stand on various issues? Where should we stand? Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to have a truly biblical worldview again. That we would understand what is our role in our generation as we are confronted by all sorts of things. And Lord, we confess that we've been drawn in, I think, through culture, through what is a very nice smiley culture at us. And I think we smile back. But I think sometimes it means we take a few steps backwards and we all keep smiling and they keep smiling and we take a few steps backwards. Oh Lord, I just pray. I pray for me and I pray for all of us here. Lord, speak to us, convict us, Holy Spirit. Help us to make a stand. May we, meet, may we be like David's mighty men. In Jesus' name, amen.